The issue of civil rights was central to Richard Nixon's life and times. It was something he thought about and cared about deeply. In 1946, the year he ran for Congress, he became a member of the NAACP. In 1957, he met doc Dr. Martin Luther King when Vice President and Mrs. Nixon and the Reverend and Mrs. King were in Ghana for that nation's independence celebration. During their talks, the Vice President invited Dr. King to visit him in Washington. A few months later, they had a three-hour meeting and then began a long-term correspondence. For Black History Month earlier this year, the Richard Nixon Foundation posted an online exhibit designed for mobile devices and computer monitors on black history in the age of Nixon. You can Google that or find it on our website, nixonfoundation.org. We are happy to have Devery Anderson here tonight to talk about his superb book. And Alex Foster is here to talk about the exciting dramatic TV miniseries that is being developed around Devery's book. And we are especially honored to have Wheeler Parker with us. He had, he and his, he had his wife fly here from Chicago to be with us tonight, and we're, we are very proud to have you here. In the East Room, there are people who are working on the mini TV miniseries, and I want to salute them for being part of this very important project. David Clark is one of the series' executive producers, and Rosanna Grace and Nicole Taub of the Serendipity Film Group were especially helpful in making tonight possible. David, Rosanna, and Nicole, thank you very much. Moderating our distinguished panel this evening is Frank Gannon. Frank began working on his PhD at Oxford. He served as a research assistant on the official life of Sir Winston Churchill. In 1971, he was named a White House Fellow. In 1973, he was named Special Assistant to the President. He flew with President and Mrs. Nixon aboard Air Force One on August 9, 1974, the President's flight home after resigning the Presidency. In San Clemente, Frank worked as Chief Editorial Assistant to the former President organizing the researching and writing of his best-selling memoir, R.N. In 1983, Frank conducted 38 hours of videotaped interviews with the former president, the most comprehensive that the president ever gave. Frank then spent five years as a producer at Late Night with David Letterman, and he still hasn't explained that role to us. Frank has been a consultant with the Richard Nixon Foundation for many years, and beginning in 2012, he was co-manager of the library's $15 million renovation. He identifies himself as the co-manager. Frank's dream is in that newly constructed exhibit. Many hours, special hours. He's a very special friend of the foundation. Frank, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, welcome all to the new Nixon Library. Uh, as Bill mentioned, Devery's book is going to be the basis of a, uh, a dramatic uh, mini-series. Um, and so it's my pleasure to introduce, uh, as my bookend, uh, Alex Foster, who is one of the uh, uh, executive producers of the project. Uh, Alex is a graduate of the Berkeley uh, College of Music and the USC uh, uh, Film School, uh, School of Cinematic Arts. Uh, he's the president of production of the Middleton uh, Media Group. Among his uh, credits are a documentary on gerrymandering called, gerrymandering called uh, Gerrymandering. Uh, it's descriptive. And, and uh, earlier this year, he was the executive producer of the film Sleepless, uh, starring Jamie Foxx and Michelle Monaghan. Uh, Alex? Uh, so thank you for having me. Um, the way that I got involved with the incredible book and, and uh, the story um, was Rosanna and David, who were mentioned before, uh, approached us with a book. Um, this story, the story of Emma Till, has always been one I've been particularly sort of obsessed with ever since sort of coming across it as a teenager. It's always been in the back of my mind. Um, and I think for us as a company and for producers in general, the idea of finding these kinds of stories in our history that still have such 
uh, sort of in this case tragic significance to our current sort of modern world and, and where we are as a society uh, is is you know extremely important and, and near and dear to our hearts and so you know we are deep in development Devery's book is incredible because it, it reveals elements of the case and the story that really no one else has been able to find and, and Devery did such an exhaustive and incredible sort of deep dive into some very difficult and hard material. Um, and yeah, you know, just honored, honored by it and honored to be here and to meet you finally. Good. Uh, all of our visitors here are VIPs, uh, but there is one very special VIP tonight that I want to single out, uh, Dr. Marvell Parker. Uh, Dr. Parker has had a distinguished uh, career of commitment and accomplishment in academics and church and community, and uh, we're honored by her presence. Uh, this is also, I believe, the 50th anniversary of her marriage to our guest, Wheeler Parker. Uh, in May 1955, uh, Reverend George Lee, a leader of the Mississippi uh, voting rights movement, was shot and killed uh, as he was driving home at night. On August 13th, uh, Mississippi voting rights leader Lamar Smith was killed, shot and killed at 10 o'clock uh, in the morning uh, in public in a courthouse square. Two weeks later, 14-year-old Emmett Till arrived on the train from Chicago uh, to spend some time with his family. Three months later, at the end of November 1955, the uh, Reverend T.R.M. Howard, who truly deserves a uh, biography, uh, delivered a sermon about Emmett Till's lynching and the travesty of the trial uh, at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. And the benediction was given and uh, uh, Dr. Howard was introduced by the new young pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, uh, Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. In the congregation that day was Rosa Parks, and a week later, on December 5th, 1955, she said that she was thinking of Emmett Till when she refused to give up her seat on a Montgomery uh, community bus. And uh, that was the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott led by Dr. King. Two years later, at the end of September 1957, President Eisenhower sent federal troops to compel integration at Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. Earlier that summer, Vice President Nixon, as President of the Senate, was the driving force behind the uh, passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1957. It wasn't easy and it wasn't enough, but it was an important start and it helped to pave the way for the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act uh, under President Johnson. As Dr. King said, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Emmett Till's death was a tragic milestone on that moral arc. Um, and we are honored to have Wheeler Parker uh, and Devery Anderson here to talk about it tonight. Um, in August 1955, our most honored guest, uh, Wheeler Parker, was 14-year-old uh, Emmett Till's 16-year-old cousin. Uh, he was also visiting Mississippi that summer and was asleep in Moe's Wright's house when uh, on that uh, steamy Sunday n night or in the early hours of that morning when the murderers Bryant and Milam came in and shined a flashlight in his face because they were looking for his cousin Emmett Till who was asleep in another room. Uh, from being thrust so suddenly and so tragically and so young, into history. Uh, Wheeler Parker has devoted his life to service and uh, faith and education. Um, after retiring from a 55 year career as a barber, he is now the pastor of Argo Temple Church of God in Christ and the superintendent of Good Tidings District, a uh, man of many hats, which is unusual for a barber. Uh, he does missionary work in Belize, uh, in Central America, where he is currently building a church in the capital city. He is completing work on his memoirs titled A Few Days Full of Trouble, The Wheeler Parker Story. Tonight, Devery Anderson is going to talk about his book, and then he and Wheeler Parker will take questions. Devery is a graduate of the University of Utah. 
He is an editor uh, at Signature Books in Salt Lake City. He has written and edited several books on Mormon history, uh, two of which are award-winning. The story of Emmett Till couldn't be more tragic or more heartbreaking or more infuriating or more consequential. It was the murder that shocked the world. And it's no less shocking today than it was in 1955. And it did propel the civil rights movement. And that can be a source of consolation and inspiration. The dignity and courage of Emmett Till's mother, Mamie, who was getting ready to welcome her son back home from a couple of weeks uh, spending summer with his cousins, uh, welcoming him back to Chicago, uh, when she suddenly found herself at the center of a tragedy that outraged America and the world. Um, and she plays a very important and inspiring part in Devery's book. The late civil rights leader uh, and icon Julian Bond wrote the foreword for uh, Devery's book. Julian's widow, uh, Pam Horowitz, isn't able to be with us uh, here tonight, but she has recorded a video uh, introduction for us. Greetings. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but delighted that I can participate this way. My late husband, Julian Bond, and I first met Devery Anderson when he was working on the book that would become Emmett Till, The Murder That Shook the World, and compelled the Civil Rights Movement. Devery volunteered to come on one of the civil rights tours that Julian led for the University of Virginia. That year, we were going to Mississippi. Devery said he would meet the tour and take us to the sites near Money, Mississippi, associated with the Till atrocity. Visiting those sites was chilling and compelling as is Devery's book. And like Devery's book, visiting those sites made us think about the issues, past, present, and future, that resonate with the Till case. When Devery finished his book, he asked Julian if he would write the foreword. Julian happily agreed. This is part of what he wrote. Emmett Till was a boy, only 14. I was a boy one year older. My family was about to move south again, and I can remember saying, if they can do that to him, what won't they do to me? Emmett Till's murder haunted me as it haunted others across the country. The Till story was a touchstone narrative of my generation. Julian concluded by saying, this is a courtroom drama, a murder mystery with villains not yet identified. This is a book that covers its subject magnificently. Above all, this is a labor of love. I think you will feel that love when Devery gives his presentation. Please enjoy, and thank you. Devery Anderson. Thank you. Well, that was very kind of Pam. Um, she's, her and Julian both uh, meant a lot to me for the two and a half years that I knew them before Julian's passing. And uh, that just meant a lot for her to take that time to do that. And I'm so honored to be here with Reverend Wheeler Parker. And I thought about this. You know, I could take my whole evening, I think, and just talk about you tonight. Wheeler Parker is, is one of the most, he's just a personal hero to me. Just, I can't emphasize that enough. And he's just one of the most decent human beings I've ever known. He just, if the world is full of Wheeler Parkers, this would be the most wonderful world we could possibly live in. And uh, just what he lived through, uh, he's compassionate, he lived through this whole thing, and I'm so glad you're going to tell about it in your book. Uh, it's a first-hand account that's very, very important to, to have, and I think everybody needs to read it when it comes around out, so keep that in mind and remember that, uh, his book, when it comes out. Uh, to set the stage for the story I want to tell, I do kind of want to jump ahead a little bit um, in this story. On November 29th, uh, 1955, uh, E. Frederick Morrow, who is administrator for special projects in the Eisenhower administration, sent White House staff mem member uh, Maxwell Rabb a memorandum lamenting the situation in the South. More particularly, he addressed the murder of Emmett Till, which had occurred in Mississippi three months earlier and had made international headlines. 
Life had not been easy for Morrow since joining the administration that July of 55. Uh, the only black man in the White House, he would have been an anomaly for any administration uh, prior to this one, and his experience would likely have been the same no matter which president he had served under. Other staff members were, to quote Morrow, quote, cold but correct, unquote, in their treatment of him, and he was often mistaken as a servant at official affairs. His role and personal experience made him particularly sensitive to the nation's reaction to the Till murder. Quote, this particular situation is so fraught with emotion because of the circumstances under which the crime was committed and the fact that the victim was a youngster that normal methods of dealing with the unusual case of crime are not completely acceptable to all of the interested parties, end quote. Morrow, believing, quote, that we are on the verge of a dangerous, evil conflagration, um, I'm sure I pronounced that right, in the southern section of the country, and quote, agonized that wherever his duties had taken him throughout the country, quote, the one theme on the lips and in the minds of all Negroes is the injustice of the Till matter and the fact that nothing can be done to affect justice in this case, end quote. This was creating a situation that could only be described as explosive. He was also becoming, it was also becoming unbearable for Morrow and quoting him here to Maxwell Rabb, as a member of the White House staff, I am sitting in the middle of this and I have been accused of being cowardly for not bringing the situation to the attention of the administration and requesting the president to make some kind of observation on this unwholesome problem. My mail has been heavy and angry and wherever I go, people have expressed disappointment that no word has come from the White House deploring this situation. I always point out, of course, that our Attorney General has followed the situation with interest and skill and that he will act when and if federal laws are violated. But this does not still the protestations. There is a clamor for some kind of statement from the White House that will indicate the administration is aware of and condemns with vigor any kind of racist activity in the United States. Morrow suggested that Vice President Nixon invite several black leaders to Washington to talk together about the problem and to do it, quote, dispassionately. It would reassure the black community that the administration was concerned while also putting racists on alert that their un-American tactics would result in prosecution by the Attorney General. Morrow also noted that thousands were attending large rallies all over the country protesting the Till murder and that the case was, quote, the subject of numerous Sunday sermons in the pulpits of the land, end quote. And unbeknownst to Morrow, one of the most significant of these was held just a couple days earlier that uh, Frank Gannon had mentioned that TRM Howard, as part of a, a nationwide tour that he was going on, that was speaking around at different churches, he spoke at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church where Martin Luther King was pastor. Rosa Parks was in the audience, and it was just a few days later that she refused to give up her seat on the bus. And of course, the Mon Montgomery bus boycott, boycott began. She remembered this meeting uh, decades later. 30 years later, she said, the first mass meeting that we held in Montgomery following Till's death was when Dr. T.R.M. Howard came to speak to a community meeting and he was telling us about it in detail. And as Frank also mentioned, she uh, recalled later on that she um, was thinking of Emmett Till that day that she refused to give up her, bus, her seat on the bus. The day after, the, the, the boycott hadn't made, it was just, you know, her arrest was on the f first things got rolling over the next few days and the bus boycott, boycott began. But on December 2nd, uh, before this was even news, uh, one day after her arrest, the Till murder and related Southern atrocities were the topics of an Eisenhower cabinet meeting at the White House. The president was still recovering from his September heart attack and he was absent, but Vice President Nixon presided in his stead. Uh, one issue on the agenda was the upcoming State of the Union message was going to be in January 1956. A planned focus of the speech was the divisive topics of, topic of civil rights uh, with some emphasis on the segregation of citizens councils founded in Mississippi uh, 18 months earlier in, in response to the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Attorney General Brownell uh, wanted to eliminate any language that would anger the South in the, in the speech. And rather than face accusations of, quote, waving the red flag, and quote, Brownell reasoned the administration should limit itself to a short statement in support of the Supreme Court decision and leave it at that. 
He also reminded his colleagues that the Department of Justice had been under intense pressure to investigate racial violence in Dixie, particularly the Till murder. Now, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles listened carefully and offered his own opinions. He called the Till case, the Till killing, tragic, yet he worried about political and constitutional ramifications should the administration get involved. Nixon, however, proposed one way out of the dilemma by suggesting, suggesting they push the issue onto Congress. That indeed did happen after Eisenhower proposed a civil rights bill that lawmakers then wrangled about for months. The Emmett Till case was a major motivator behind the Civil Rights Act of 1957. And if you read the congressional record, you'll see all these references to Emmett Till from various members uh, of Congress. And after a lot of compromise in that and filibustering in the South, I think a record one at the time, uh, that bill was signed into act into to law. So to the point I want to drive home by reading that is that the Emmett Till case was in the news. It was discussed by people from the President of the United States on down. Everybody knew at this point, and within days of the killing, that everybody knew the name of Emmett Till. Prior to that, he was known by a handful of people, Wheeler Parker being one of them, and this group of people, Emmett and Wheeler, took the train uh, down south with uh, Moses Wright, who was Wheeler Parker's grandfather, Emmett Till's great uncle. The three of them went down south, uh, and Money, Mississippi, I suppose we could describe it as one of the most obscure places on the planet, probably. Uh, just a ha handful of stores on the main street and a handful of people, I suppose, <laughs> to go in those stores. But for something this tragic to happen over just a short encounter in this store that otherwise would have just had just a different decision been made, let's not go out tonight, or let's... Uh, go to a different store or whatever, just, you know, none of this would have happened, but a, just a brief encounter in the store where Emmett Till is in the store and he whistles at the storekeeper's wife, that one brief moment set all this off to where the, everybody's talking about it. And it tells you how explosive this situation was that it took something like this to finally just wake up the country uh, as to this what was happening in the South. The South, I think, was considered the North's backyard, and what happened in the South stayed in the house in the South. But we had a 14-year-old, a child, who's from the North, comes to, Chicago, comes to Mississippi from Chicago. We're linking North and South together now, suddenly, over this one instance. And uh, then this, the whole thing blows up, and we have something that influenced the halls of Congress and has been a powerful influence ever since. Another point I want to drive home is that enduring legacy of the Till case. Began then, and you see it unfolding in 1955, that this was something that was too big and wasn't just a southern problem. It really reflected a national problem, national attitudes, uh, where de facto segregation up in the north was just still happening. It wasn't on the books, and so, but people still, the racial issue existed in the north, it existed in the south. It, when Emmett Till visited the South, it was interesting because the day that he went into the store and did the famous wolf whistle, uh, the, the governor, uh, governor's race had been decided on and was, in, was news that day in the newspapers. Uh, the five men who had run for governor all tried to out-segregationist each other uh, to get the vote. The Brown decision had just been reached a year and a half earlier. There was this backlash in the South with the the citizens' councils uh, being formed and that. And it was just the worst possible timing for Emmett Till to be there because this case became, if you read the papers or have read the papers in, in, in history books and that, this was a case of a black man, how the press portrayed it, a black man, not a child, because they saw him as a man in this case because that's how they needed to portray him to really you know, get the acquittal that they wanted in the South a black man assaulting a white woman. That's how they portrayed it, and that's all they needed to hear uh, to assure that there would be an acquittal in this case. Now, Emma Till's mother, as Frank mentioned, was a real hero in this case, because when you think about it, it was her only son. She sends him south to the south, and she gave him the talk to be careful what you say, how you act, and, and what happens in the south isn't, what, you know, isn't the same as what's going to what life is like in the North. And so she sent him down there, 
I took him to the train station on August 20th, 1955. Again, nobody knew her, nobody knew him. When they went to the train station that day, they went, nobody paid attention. When she went to retrieve him two weeks later, the whole world knew who he was, and she was met by the press, uh, and she was clamored. The press was everywhere. The courageous thing that she did that gave this such attention at this point, because there had been lynchings in the South for decades. Most didn't get reported, none. There was ever even a trial held, really. Uh, any, nobody was ever really brought to justice on these things. This case, even though there was no justice, uh, the fact that it even went to, to trial uh, is a result of, of the publicity it got. And one of the reasons it got publicity that it did was because of Emmett's mother making a very brave decision. I want to read a little portion uh, from my book about this. Now, it's, it's no secret. You know, Emmett was, was brutally kidnapped. You know, he's kidnapped as a result of this wolf whistle three days later by the woman's husband and half-brother. They take him out. Um, he's not seen or heard from again alive, but three days later, his body uh, is found in the Tallahatchie River, brutally murdered over this incident. And his body is sent back home to Chicago. And his mother sees this body and makes an important decision. And I'm sure we've all heard that, but I want to read her words about this. This is somewhat graphic, and I apologize in advance for that, but these are her words that were published, and I, I take them here and use them in my book. But I want to, uh, if you hear this, you'll realize what she was facing the day that she uh, brought him home. So, uh, She met his body at the train station. Mamie waited with her family. And, oh, that she met him at the train station and followed a hearse uh, that, that picked the body up at the train station and took it to the Rainer and Sons funeral home in Chicago. And she followed that hearse to the funeral home. And when she was there, when she got there, two other people from Jet Magazine were waiting. Uh, Simeon Booker and who was a reporter for Jet Magazine, and uh, uh, David Jackson, who was a photographer. They were waiting, and when she went into the building, they followed behind her. And uh, Mamie waited in the, with her family in a separate room while Rayner opened the casket. Now a witness to the body's condition himself, he again tried to dissuade Mamie from viewing it. After this failed, Rayner acquiesced. Rayfield Moody went in first, looked at the mangled corpse, and then went back for, with Mamie, for Mamie. With her father on one side and Jean Mobley on the other, she made her approach to the room containing her son. And this is what she said just a few weeks after, with one of the first speeches she gave. So this was all fresh in her memory. And I like to go back to the earliest accounts, because uh, she talked about this a lot over the years, but I wanted to get it, one that was when it was fresh in her mind. And I found a few speeches she gave, and these all are, agree with each other. The first thing that greeted us as we walked into the parlor was a terrible odor. I think I'll carry that odor with me to my grave, she said a few months later. As she neared the casket, she could see her son, naked, covered with lime. Quote, what I saw looked like it came from outer space. It didn't like, look like anything that we could dream, imagine in a funny book, or any place else. It just didn't look like it was for real. Standing over the casket, Mamie began to examine Emmett's right side. She noticed first a large gash in his forehead, which she assumed had been made with an ax. The mouth was open and the tongue was protruding. Quote, his lips were twisted and the teeth were, his teeth were bared, just like a snarling dog's, she said. Then she saw the gunshot wound. Quote, I wondered why they wasted a bullet, because surely it wasn't necessary, end quote. Some features she recognized, such as the nose and forehead. One eye was missing, probably lost during the embalming process, but the other, despite being detached, was the right color. Still looking at the right side, she said, I found that part of the ear was gone and the entire back of the head had been knocked out. Mamie then asked Rayner to remove her son from the casket so that she could examine the left side also. He agreed, but asked her to go home first, send back some clothes, and then finish viewing the body once it was dressed. Although Mamie left, 
Booker and Jackson stayed behind and watched as attendants lifted the body from the casket and placed it onto a slab. In that instant, and this is now comes from Simeon Booker's recollection, they were horrified to see a piece of Till's skull fall off onto the slab. And then Simeon Booker says, calmly, Dave replaced the skull, just like putting on a hat. Mamie and her party returned to the mortuary an hour or so later. When she approached her son the second time as he lay on a slab, she saw for the first time the left side of his face. Quote, it looked as if somebody had taken a crisscross knife and gone insane. It was beaten into a pulp. And David Jackson took photos on this occasion that were published in Jet Magazine, which sold a record number of copies. They had to, it went far beyond its print run, and they, its normal print run, and they had to reprint it. Her insisting on seeing her son, her allowing these photos to appear in the national press, and that was a brave thing. This is her flesh and blood, and not only is she seeing this, but she's putting it out there for the world to see. And people accused her of exploiting her son's death. They had every all these reasons why she was doing a bad thing, was a bad mother. She had to live with those criticisms, but she knew in her heart that she had to help the world see what they did to her son. So she insisted on an open casket funeral as well for that very reason, so that the whole world can see what they did to my son. So what she just saw, she put on display for the world to see. And that move helped get this press coverage. Now, it was covered in the black press because... They were sympathetic to Emmett Till. They wanted to wake the world up to racism. The northern press handled it in a number of ways. The southern white press handed, just ignored those photos. And what they did was took the photo of him with his mother, which you see there, cropped her out very often, and enlarged him to make him look like he was this big, older brute. That's how they wanted to portray him, as this, as this black beast rapist of you know, mythical southern lore. And so that's how the Southern press saw Emmett Till. And as you can imagine, the Southern white press were very um, sympathetic to the killers. It didn't start off that way. There were a couple of days where they were outraged that Emmett Till was murdered by these men, and they said justice must prevail. But they noticed something starting to happen. The Northern press was becoming very critical of the South, allowing this to happen in the context of segregation. Now, and by 1955, maybe under normal circumstances, they would have been very outraged at a, a killing of a black boy. At least they started off saying that. But the second segregation was scrutinized in the spotlight, they realized that if we lose this one, we are going to lose our southern way of life. I want to read a little portion from a letter. Now, this may sound like it's something that far beyond anything you'd really expect someone to ever say, but I read tons and tons of letters that people sent to the prosecution, the judge, even the defense from, north, from the north, elsewhere in the south, saying that um, you can't allow this thing to happen. Uh, you can't allow these men to become convicted or to be convicted because if you do, then we've lost. Here's one letter that someone wrote, and this is typical of many, trust me, I read, <laughs> I read them, and, and you read the papers, people were openly siding with the killers, wanting them to be freed, uh, the stores in the area had put jars to raise money for the defense. It wasn't uncommon at all to go into any store in Tallahatchie County and see these defense jars in there. Uh, one person wrote, and I'm not going to use the language, I'm just going to use, say the letter N, and you'll know what I'm talking about because I'm not going to say this out loud. I don't, like, I don't feel comfortable at all doing that, but you'll, you'll understand what I'm saying. I'm not changing history, I'm just toning it down for my, my speech, for what I want to say. One letter writer wrote of his abhorrence, and this is someone from Chicago, abhorrence in, quote, seeing a N and some white trash walking arm in arm and living together. Do you want that to happen in your state? End quote. In Chicago, the writer claimed, whites have no rights and are forced to, quote, ride with an N, eat with an N, and often live in the same house with an N and can't complain. The Supreme Court and the NAACP together were trying to create a nation of mulattoes, uh, the, the writer claimed. The real issue, uh, however, was clear. Quote, convict these two white men, and every N in Mississippi will think he can, it is open season on white women, and there will be nothing uh, you will be able to do about it, for you will have set a precedent. Once again, uh, this, an end quote. And once again, in the writer's mind, this would lead to a slippery slope. 
quote, from there on, there is no stopping, next mixing children in schools, then intermarriage, and eventually a nation of mulattoes in the United States. Remember, God did not make a mulatto. There was only one way to stop it, and this lengthy quote here. I believe the two defendants, Milam Bryant and Milam, if they did what they are accused of, might have been a little rough. But rough tactics were required, because if that end got away with it, word would spread around fast, and there would be no stopping the ends. A thing like that must be stopped right away, for once it gets rolling, there is no stopping. And if that end got away with it, his friends would do the same thing next time they came to town, and every white woman would have to comply or cause a race riot. So you see the attitude in the South. It's abhorrent, but that's what the, that was the prevailing attitude, and that's what the jury saw as well. So as you can imagine, this all-white jury, after three days of testimony, the trial lasted five days. The first day and a half was jury selection, Monday to Tuesday afternoon. And uh, they recessed on Tuesday afternoon because they found some other witnesses who were able to place the murder of Emmett Till in another county, Sunflower County. There was some internal arguments. They decided, well, we did, the people on the plantation where Emmett Till was seen, they didn't hear a gunshot, so we assume he was beaten in the shed in Sunflower County and then shot in Tallahatchie County. It's not really what happened, most likely. He was killed in Sunflower County. But because that was their belief, or at least the excuse they wanted to use, the trial was a day and a half in, they didn't want to change venue, so they just um, proceeded in Tallahatchie County. But um, in Tallahatchie County, there were no registered black voters. To, red, to be on a jury, you had to be a registered voter, and you had to be male. They didn't allow women to sit on juries at the time. So we had these 12 white men who, with this attitude that had been in the southern press for days, even though they tried to weed out jurors that weren't influenced, you know, in a small county like Tallahatchie, you've been reading the papers, you know exactly what's being said about Emmett Till, that he assaulted this white woman. That's all they had to hear. Nothing they could hear after that was going to change their minds. So the men were acquitted after 67 minutes, and, um, and that was it. Uh, not guilty. Despite the fact that the sheriff, or Moses Wright, uh, testified and pointed out these men in court, uh, as the ones who had kidnapped Emmett Till. Uh, the sheriff of LaFleur County, where the county where money was at, they, he was kidnapped in LaFleur County, and so uh, the kidnapping charges were in LaFleur. That sheriff and his deputy both testified that the Milam and Bryant told them, confessed to them when they arrested them, that, that they had kidnapped Emmett Till, but let him go. And so the, that's what they said until the body surfaced, and they didn't say another word after that. And so the, the, the defense tried to make an argument that that wasn't really Emmett Till's body even. It was too unrecognizable. It could have been anybody, despite the fact that he had a ring on his finger that had the initials LT, standing for Lewis Till, which, were Emmett Till, which was Emmett Till's father, a ring that was well known to uh, uh, Mose Wright's sons, uh, Simeon, Robert, and Maurice, who, and maybe, you, I can't remember if you, had you seen the ring prior to? Oh, yes. So it was familiar to the, to the boys who were all there with Emmett. NW, or the, the defense tried to make an argument that they somehow got that ring, put it on another body and put it in the river, and this was all done as an, to embarrass the state of Mississippi and to uh, give them bad press over segregation. So the jury, that was the excuse the jury used that the state didn't prove that there was a murder. And when the kidnapping trial came around, they didn't even get to trial. They went to a grand jury and Moses Wright testified uh, the, the sheriff and deputy testified that they got kidnapping confessions out of these men and the ju grand jury didn't even indict them on kidnapping. And so uh, they didn't even get as far as a trial for a crime they confessed to the police of committing. So that was the South at the time. Um, and that's what they were up against. And so these men, you know, they not guilty on murder, never had to serve a day for uh, kidnapping, didn't even go to trial. So that was an injustice that Emmett Till's mother had to live with. The fact that these men kidnapped and murdered her son and two counties let them go. She suffered another injustice in January of 1956 when these men, when it was too late for them, obviously they'd been acquitted for murder, so they um, couldn't be tried again for that. They sold their story to an inquiring journalist named William Bradford Huey for $3,150, uh, 
which would be about 35,000 today, uh, and told the story of how they kidnapped and murdered Emmett Till. They were free from, you know, they, they could do this and not be prosecuted. Well, there was still the issue of kidnapping. They could have been tried on kidnapping still because they weren't acquitted on kidnapping. The grand jury just didn't indict, so should more evidence come to light, they could have been kid tried for that. Well, what better evidence than a confession out of their own mouths uh, published in a national paper or a national magazine? But the, the judge in LaFleur covering the district that LaFleur County was in um, said no one's going to convict someone on an article like that because the reporter's not going to say where he really got the information. Myler and Bryant have to, have to testify against each other. They'll never be able to prove it, so why even bother? So nothing ever happened there. So Emmett's mother had to live through another injustice of uh, hearing these men confess, basically. And I don't like to use the word confess because confession often uh, implies some remorse. They weren't saying they were remorseful. They wanted money, and they didn't tell the whole story anyway because there were others, it turns out, who were involved in this murder and kidnapping. Uh, a few other white men and some other black men that were involved in the sense that they were basically told by Milam that to, to restrain Emmett Till on the back of the truck and clean up the mess afterwards. And Milam was a big overbearing man who would have made them do that or their lives would have been threatened. So they weren't in on it in the same way that the white men were. They were just there forced into it. The white men were Milam's and a brother-in-law of Milam and Bryant. Those, and they wanted to protect them from prosecution because they, their names hadn't even turned up yet. So they didn't implicate them in their story and so they didn't even mention them. So the other injustice was Emma's mother had to live through that and that knowing there were other men who got away with murder. Well, she lived with this for decades. She went on to become, when my first interview with her, she told me, I lost my only son, but I went on to become a school teacher. I was going to be destined to be a homebody like my mother was. But after this happened, I decided to go to school. She became a school teacher. She founded the Emmett Till Foundation, the Emmett Till Players, which she gathered kids every year to recite uh, uh, speeches, of, to memorize and recite speeches of Dr. Martin Luther King. And she told me once that she helped a lot of kids who were destined for the street otherwise, uh, who would later on become ministers and doctors and lawyers, that she was an influence in countless others' lives. She lost the one child, but she was uh, influential in so many others. So she went on to live an exemplary life. And she was spared from one more injustice, um, which she, want, she, she fought to have the case reopened because knowing that there were others involved, knowing that the state of Mississippi handled this trial so poorly, she told me, she said, I don't necessarily want people to even go to jail. I just want the state of Mississippi to apologize for what they did uh, in, in, in seeking justice for my son. They didn't seek it, and it was, never came about. She goes, I, I just want an apology. But it turns out there were other people living, these people that were on the back of the truck, people who were in the truck, um, and others. And Carolyn Bryant, who was the uh, woman that Emmett Till whistled at, Moses Wright, when they kidnapped Emmett Till, he told the police that he heard someone out in the car. It was so dark, he couldn't even see beyond the front porch to even see what kind of vehicle was out there. But he heard, when they took Emmett Till out to the car, he heard uh, someone ask someone else, is this the right one? And he said it sounded like a woman's voice. And he heard a voice saying, yes, it is. Well, by, by aiding these men into, uh, in their crime, even though she wasn't present for the murder, if she was singling out who was Emmett Till, who wasn't, and that, and there were some other people that came forward later and said, yeah, that same day I was in Bryant's store, he accosted me and said, are you the one that uh, whistled at my wife? And Carolyn had to intervene and say, no, that's not the right one. There were two other cases besides the night they uh, identified Emmett, where they were weeding out some other kids in the area. And so her involvement in, in aiding them uh, there was court precedent for this that she could have been tried for manslaughter. Even though she wasn't there, she helped them in their crime in that sense. So the FBI reopened an investigation into the Till case in, 19, or in 2004, almost 50 years later. During the course of their investigation, they found out a lot of stuff. They found the trial transcript, which had been missing for, for 50 years almost. They exhumed Emma Till's body and performed an autopsy, and in doing that, proved that he was who he was. 
because they thought if this goes to trial again, we can't have the defense saying we don't even know this is Emmett Till's body. So they were able to do through DNA prove who he was, as if there was any doubt amongst anyone who was sane. But, um, but for legal purposes, they had to be able to have the proof, and they got it. And um, there was an investigation from 2004 to 2006. The FBI turned the, the, their findings over to the state of Mississippi. In 2007, in February, uh, the district attorney uh, formed a grand jury and tried to um, present evidence, or presented evidence, against Carolyn Bryant uh, for manslaughter. But the, the jury um, felt there wasn't enough evidence, and I don't know, obviously the grand jury deliberations are secret. Some of them talked later. I don't know even what was or wasn't presented. All I know is that they decided not to uh, pursue uh, manslaughter charges against her, and so that ended. Um, as a result of the autopsy, we learned that Emmett Till, was, the, body, the damage done to him was far greater. You know, you could see before that his, his head had been beaten, but he had bones in his, uh, I think his wrists and bones in his legs that were also broken, so the beating was far more extensive than uh, we knew before. During that time, when they exhumed his body and did the autopsy, they buried him in a new casket, which I think is standard when this happened. So he was buried in a brand new casket. His original casket was placed in storage at the Baroque Cemetery. That casket was important because if you've seen footage of the Till case, when his mother insisted on this open casket funeral, she left his body on display for five days. And thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people filed past this casket over those, over that, uh, those five days. And, uh, so it was significant, and so the plan was to put the, the casket into a, a museum on Burr Oak Cemetery. They were going to build one, an Emmett Till Memorial Museum there. And so it was in storage. In 2007, when I went to Chicago for my first time, in fact, I interviewed Wheeler Parker and his uh, uncle, Simeon Wright, on that occasion in, in Reverend Parker's office at his church. And that was a wonderful interview, interviewing you both together, because you both brought out things that the other stuff I would never would have thought to ask. And you'd say something to Simeon, and it's like, wait, I didn't know that, and I wouldn't have thought to ask that. And it more, I, I just got a ton of information by interviewing them together, so it was a wonderful day. But the day before that, I was at the cemetery, saw the grave for the first time, asked them if I could see the casket. And it was the middle of a blizzard. Like, I'd never, I didn't know it could ever be so cold anywhere. And Chicago was, I had like three coats on, and the, and the wind was just cutting right through. I've never experienced cold like that in my life. And, and they took a pickaxe and went out and picked around until they found the, the grave. They knew the general area, and then I got, this, uh, I got to see the grave. But then they took me into the, cemetery, into the, sh uh, into the sh shed. And I'm going to read a little bit here in closing uh, about this, because this is a very personal moment for me, where this case really became not just history, but it became personal. It had been become, becoming that way since I got to know Till family members. Um, but this really did it. I'm going to just read this in, in closing. A large storage shed stood near the cemetery office, and inside um, uh, was another casket. And, and talking about Emmett being reburied, I mentioned that prior to this, buried in a new casket. Inside was another casket. This one was empty. Uh, it was not new and shiny, but had been uh, spent five decades below ground. Its brown exterior had faded from age and the elements. Inside, the once white, soft fabric that lined the lid was torn, brittle, and had become discolored from the rust that had rubbed off the metal. Until just a couple of days earlier, this box had held Emmett Till's remains for 50 years. In February 2007, in the midst of this blizzard, I visited Burr Oak, and they took this casket down for me, as I mentioned. Um, and I stood there as I, they, they opened the casket and left. Now, when they, and left me in there alone, and when Emma was buried originally, they placed a glass top over the casket, or over him, um, so that, and I don't know if it was, probably a variety of reasons, but probably so that people couldn't touch him, and maybe to, to seal in the smell, because even though they tried to embalm him in Mississippi, there was still a bad odor, and they wanted to, to I think it was a combination of the reasons. <sighs> But back in September 1955, tens of thousands of mourners had stood in long lines in a Chicago church in order to file by this very casket and see the effects of racism at its extreme. 
The victim, showing every sign of hate imaginable, had been covered with a clear glass viewing panel so that people could uh, see but not touch the body. Suddenly, I became one of those who had touched that same lid, placed my hand on that same glass, and looked inside. And one of the things they told me, or that Dale Killinger, who was the FBI uh, agent who investigated the case, was that when they exhumed the body, they found thousands of fingerprints on the glass and on the lid from people who had filed by and touched that, that were still as fresh 50 years later as they were the day uh, that they you know, were created on top of the casket. And then suddenly I was one with those. I placed my hand on that very glass and touched that very lid. And I was, I was suddenly part of history because I added my fingerprints to those thousands of others. And I tried to imagine for a moment that I, I, in wanting to be one with them, I leaned over and looked in that glass and tried to imagine that I could see Emmett Till lying there just like they did all those years earlier. And although the casket was empty now, I leaned over and imagined this. Uh, imagine staring at the beaten, bloated, and decomposing face of Emmett Till, as it has thousands of others so many years earlier. Yet when I looked into the casket, however, I found that the glass had also suffered from 50 years below ground. It had darkened to the point that I could hardly see through to the padding upon which Emmett had once lain. Because it was no longer a window, but a mirror, I saw something that those thousands before me never had, a reflection. I immediately noted the irony. There I was, looking into a darkened glass, but those who came before me had been looking through a glass darkly, uh, to borrow the words of the biblical apostle Paul, even though the glass in a very literal sense had been crystal clear for them. In other words, time had not yet enabled them to grasp the significance of the Emmett Till story in the same way that I, as a historian living in a new era, was able to do. Yet I was sufficiently humbled almost immediately as I tried to make sense of the fact that my seeing Emmett Till through my imagination had been blocked. I could not see him because all I could see was myself. This realization forced me to, to pause for self-reflection as I drove from the cemetery. Yes, I had escaped the racist mindset embraced by most Southern whites at the time, at the time Emmett Till was buried the first time. But I realized most powerfully that day that this may have been so only as a matter of luck. What if I had been born early enough to have been an adult male in 1955 or had been born in Mississippi? The likelihood that I would have seen this tragic murder through different eyes is almost certain. In other words, I am horrified by this tragedy and others like it because I was born at a time and place that allowed me to bypass the prejudices that millions of others could not. As I drove away, I wondered why our common humanity has not been sufficient on its own to stamp out the trappings of cultural conditioning where that conditioning is so deplorable. And I still wonder that today. Thank you. Thank you, Devery. Uh, Devery and the panel have agreed to answer your questions. I just want, want to announce first that Emmett Till is available for uh, purchase in the museum store, and Devery would be happy to uh, sign your books uh, after, after the event. I'd like to ask the first uh, question to Devery or anyone else on the panel would like to answer it. Um, you would, Devery, you would mentioned earlier about uh, the legacy of the Emmett Till case. Uh, in today's social and political culture, what can we all learn from um, this horrific case? There's so many things. Um, I think, you know, at the time people saw, tried to say that this is just a local matter, um, that uh, it could have happened anywhere, that this wasn't a racial incident, and, and people believe, a lot of people believe that. Today, people looking back don't see that. I don't know if anybody who looks back now and says, oh, that was just a local matter. It could have happened anywhere. People, it took time and perspective for a lot of people to see how that it was an ugly, vicious race crime. And I see things happening today a lot that people say, well, yes, and I see people talk about Emmett Till will say, well, that was a horrible thing that happened then. But some of these things that happened today aren't. Those are just local matters. They're, uh, and it's, it's, I think time and perspective is often what's needed. And I think if we could remember, or often, is often what happens. 
But I think if we could remember the past, that's when we talk, and it's so cliche to say, if we don't learn from history, you know, what's the saying, you know, it's going to repeat itself or whatever, or, you know, the, the past is never really past, I think Faulkner said. If we really learn from the past, we can see the present for what it is. And I think that's what, M, that's what M, the, the power of the Till case, you know, there was never justice in 55, and because of that lack of justice, his name was one of the things that, in his case, was one of the things that motivated the Civil Rights Act of 57. 50 years later, when there wasn't justice a second time around, that's one of the things that helped um, inspire the um, Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Rights Act, where Congress and President Bush signed this into law 10 years ago, that uh, where Congress would appropriate uh, 10, up to $10 million a year to investigate cold civil rights cases. And the Emmett Till Bill 2 was just passed and signed by President Obama last year because the first one was set to expire. And so it's been renewed now. And so the, the, even though we would have all loved to have seen justice in the case, if we can't have that, and I don't even want to say the upside, but the, what we, it retains its power. The, the lack of justice helps it retain its power re, because we're still angry about what happened, and that's motivated us to move a little bit. And so if there's anything that lack of, of the injustice has created, it's these other, you know, it's the, it's the Till Bill and Till Bill 2 and things like that. So his injustice has inspired so much and we're, where we're trying to do things had, and so that's part of the, the legacy there too. But we all, it's also, he serves as a measuring stick to see how far we've come and sometimes very sad that we haven't come as far as we thought or we go a few steps forward and take several back. We hear some of that same reasoning today. In fact, people were even saying back then, as the case was in the press before the trial even started, um, well, some of these, you know, like these letters I read, people are saying, you know, well, up north in Chicago, we have black people that are killing people, and no one hears a thing about it. We only hear about it if it's a white person killing a black. Well, that wasn't the case. These cases made the papers as well as anything else, but that was a way of people trying to downplay the racial element involved, saying, you know, all we care, you know, you know, whites don't do these things, but we only hear about it when one does, and we never hear about it if black does. We hear that today, too, and so the Till case is a, is a way for us to remember the past, to measure our, where we've come, see where history is repeating itself, and it also served as inspiration for us to make some change. So there's the legacy, it just really can be defined in so many ways. So that's a long way. Parker, do you have a Yes, uh, I think I meet with some of those people that lived there during that time, and what you get from them and it's to you, because we have a lot of work to do yet. They wish they had took a different stand. How will we look years from now when we didn't speak up or stand up? You feel bad. So that's what I get. We can learn from them. We can profit from their mistake. You can't live long enough to learn all the mistakes. So we can profit from their mistake by doing the right thing when you have the right opportunity. You have a question in the front row? I don't have a question, but um, I'm Dr. Eric J. Chambers, and I want to welcome you guys here to Yorba Linda. This is where I live as well. And also, I want to thank the Nixon Library and the President for bringing this here. Mrs. Mamie Till Mobley was a surrogate grandmother to me. And in 2000, her last trip to Southern California, it was to visit me here in San Diego. And also, I had the privilege of uh, speaking at her funeral a, a few minutes after Wheeler. And so basically, I just want to com uh, commend you guys for the awesome work that you've done, and I want to encourage you to continue to do it. And I want to thank you, Wheeler. You had a front row seat to history, and it's because of people like you and Simeon and Emmett. It's one of the reasons that I continue to do what I do. And ironically, uh, Debra and Mrs. Mobley actually connected you and I. We spoke on the phone, I think, you know, in the early 2000s, the two of us did. You may not remember it. Uh, but I did, and uh, it's good to finally meet you as well. And finally, uh, as a result of my relationship with her, I wrote a book called Dining with the Ancestors, and it was actually inspired by a picture of us at dinner in San Diego, me and Mrs. Mobley and her cousin Abe. And as a result, I do my part by telling the story and have been able to go all over the country to tell the story as well. And again, I just want to continue to uh, encourage you guys and uh, just excited that I'm a part of this same, uh, same story as well. Uh, first, of all, uh, first of all, thank you for having this. Um, and thank you, uh, Mr. Wheeler, for being here. 
I'm a barber as well, by the way, just wanted to say that. <laughs> but um, what do you think about um, the change of, of history by Miss Carolyn Bryant? She just, this year, said that it was, a, it was a lie. Much of what she said was a lie at trial. What, what do you guys think about that? You asking me? I'll start again, Debbie. It has made, I travel all over America speaking. And one time, one case, young man said, why are we talking about Emmett? He misbehaved. And I get that feeling when I go, now I can go, I'm knowing that he didn't do anything. I was there when he came into the store and my Uncle Simeon came shortly thereafter and when we came out, he did whistle. Some people won't deny he did whistle. And uh, it makes my speeches easier because now she's saying he did nothing worthy of death. But before it's like he got what he deserved. For 30 years, it was like he got what he deserved. They never interviewed us for 30 years and they had us almost like ashamed to even talk about it. So by her saying that, it makes it easier uh, for me to go forth and tell the story. I think and we and have every, remember, every barber gets a head. <laughs> we, we have a slide of you and your cousin uh, from back in the day. Is it, where is it? It's the, uh, the one on the bicycle. Okay, where is it? I think it's going to come up on either or both of these screens. You know, I like to, I like to preference these kind of settings uh, with saying that we didn't come in to stir up any animosity or will or hate, but just come here to talk about history. And like you said, if you forget history, you're subject to re uh, repeat it. We had it there for a moment. There it is. <laughs> that was taken in about, see that little kid on the bike? <laughs> He's in the audience. Stand up, Joe. Who you at? I think I saw you out there. He became moved out here and became a businessman. <laughs> you haven't changed. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Joe, how old were you on that picture? <laughs> OK. So that was taken in about 1949 to 1950, and I'll go Summit, Illinois. I, I'm the one that's riding uh, Joe. <laughs> yeah, and the other one to the right, or to the left facing, that's Emmett, right there where I live. I still live in that little town now. My wife is a village trustee there in that town. So that's, that's, back, that's going back some years there. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, that's a perfect picture to have up for this question. Um, as we talk about the legacy of Emmett Till and the story, uh, you were just a 16-year-old boy, right, when this happened. At what point did you understand the significance of what happened, like the, 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 the role that your cousin played in really changing the country and everything? At what, at what point in your life did you, were you Realize that it was making a change? Yeah. Wow. You know, to, to live in the South, the only way you can understand what happened, you had to have lived it. I don't care how I tell it. And Deborah did a wonderful job. He had me through all kinds of emotions here. But to understand the South, you had to live there. I lived in my formative years. We went to South, we went south together, but I had, my formative years was, was uh, spent in the South. And I knew what you were up against. I knew you had no protection whatsoever. It's hard to imagine. You were very helpless. You couldn't call anyone for help but God in those situations. And when did I realize, I never asked, been asked that question before, that there was a change being made. Uh, the changes were so gradual, but it's definitely a change because we're here today, you know, and I go to Mississippi all the time and things did change. But when did I really realize, and there was a lot of there was a big price paid for the change. In, in the midst of it, it seemed like things would never change. Sometimes the more they change, the more they remain the same. I really don't know how to actually answer that. I talked to an old man once, and he said, boy, I don't know when I got old. 
So I don't know when he changed it, but. Well, can I, can I ask a follow-up? So how does it feel now for you to go to Mississippi and remember yourself as a child oh, living at this era? Yeah, it, it, now, yes, it's a contrast. I know it's a contrast. I know a change has been made. Without a doubt, things have changed, and uh, Mississippi has more black elected officials than any other state in the union. So, I mean, everywhere I go, especially in the Delta, because the population is all black, mm -hmm. to see black sheriffs and uh, cook, the county, I'm sorry, cook county commissioners and things, they're all black. So there's a, there's a great change. There's no money there. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but the change in terms of uh, positions and power, uh, I guess power without money, I guess it's, there's something. <laughs> but anyway. You can tell the difference when you go back. And I love going to Mississippi. Remember, we didn't leave Mississippi because of treatment. We left Mississippi because of economics. Most people did not leave Mississippi. And they, they, made, they, etched, they etched out a living. And well, life doesn't consist in the abundance of things you possess anyway. Life is in what you think and how you live. It makes a difference. Thank you very much. Please give our distinguished panel another round of applause.